A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 173rd episode of Together for Education webinar brought to you by Notebook. Just over two years ago, when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of dig digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Today, 173 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated. And all thanks to your love and support. We have discussed extremely curricular topics here like digital learning, NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, topics like school finance and management, and even evolved topics like mental health. Kindness is a virtue which we envisage in every human being, but the foundation, founding stones of this wonderful virtue are laid in one's school days. We teach our kids confidence, self-worth, critical thinking, and so many other things, but in the bargain of making them confident, successful, and winners in this cutthroat competitive world, we often lose out on the basics. Kindness along with empathy and compassion are often overlooked but are still some of the most needed qualities in today's world. Denmark, which has been one of the top three happiest countries in the world for over eight consecutive years now, has made teaching empathy mandatory in its schools since 1993. Kindness refers to noticing, feeling, and acting to alleviate suffering in others. Studies show that kindness and compassion skills can be acquired through training, and the collective compassion capability can be cultivated by everyday practices. It brings a lot of physical and mental benefits, improved health and less stress, greater sense of belonging, improved self-esteem, less bullying, reduced depression, to name a few. Our first speaker on this topic today is Major General Neeraj Bali. General Bali is an Indian Army veteran who served for nearly four decades as an infantry officer. His rich operational experience came from several tenures on the border at Jammu and Kashmir, the Northeast, and Africa. He has also been the CEO of an educational society, running 92 schools and colleges with over 40,000 students on its rolls. Later, he was the CEO of an engineering company that supervised the construction of major infrastructure projects in India and abroad. He is a trainer and a global speaker. Currently, he is also a teaching faculty of the Institute for Competitive Intelligence, Germany. He is the founder of Leadscape Advisors, a corporate leadership training company, an MSc and an MPhil. He is also an alumnus of the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies USA. He is also a certified life coach and leadership mentor. General Bali, thank you so much for sparing your time to be here with us today. And over to you, sir. Thank you, Paridhi. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Let me start with a little story. So it's a story about fictional story. It's a story about two monks, uh, probably two Zen monks, Let's call one monk as a senior monk and the other a junior monk. So they were ambling along, talking to each other. And they came across a place where there was uh, a lot of stagnant water and, you know, uh, you couldn't really get past it. And there was this pretty young lady standing. She couldn't cross because it would have ruined her dress. Now the story goes that <clears throat> the dictates of the religion of these monks said that they were not supposed to touch a person of the opposite sex. But the senior monk said, can I help you? She said, I want to get across, but my dress is going to be ruined. So the senior monk said, no problem at all. He scooped her up in, her, in his arms and off they went, uh, wading through the water. And when they got to the other side, he put the lady down. Then the two monks kept walking for about 10 kilometers. And all this while they were talking about various things. But this episode was playing heavily on the junior monk's mind. And at the end of those 10 kilometers, he said, Master, I need to ask you, why did you pick up that woman? 
and the senior monk said, I put her down 10 kilometers ago. You still carrying her in your head. And now, one, the beginning point of kindness is empathy. Is like Pareti pointed out, it's even taught in countries like Denmark and Scandinavian nations. The ability to understand what the other is feeling, or if not thinking, but at least feeling, uh, uh, without necessarily agreeing with it, is what empathy is. And it is that empathy that leads to kindness. Now, the problem is, when we all are born and step into the world, we are all obsessed with me, I, me, and myself. That's the nature of the child. You know, looking at the larger worldview and his companions and so on. And children uh, can be pretty cruel if they, if, if they want to be. How do we then educate our, our students in the value of kindness? That's the topic. Now, <clears throat> the first point I would like to say is that as we learn in any leadership curriculum, and as I learned in 41 years in uniform, you cannot really teach anything unless you are demonstrating it. The power of the example far exceeds any amount of academic knowledge you give, any insights you may have to offer, or how much time you spend on a child. Children do as we do. Children don't necessarily do what we tell them to do. They might do it up to a certain age, but as they grow, even towards their parents, they start looking with skepticism and only do what the parents are actually doing. And if this is true for your flesh and blood, surely it is true for your students. So my first pointer is, we've got to get off the roller coaster of daily teaching and sit down and think, do I demonstrate kindness? Am I kind myself? Am I squashing the child when he comes up with something silly or am I being kind and generous and open-hearted? It is that which will have a ripple effect and that is what the children will learn. For example, a teacher by, by virtue of being a teacher has to, has to have a lot of patience and certainly patience with children who may not be as smart or as bright as you want them to be. So it may be a great idea to always moderate your own language your own conduct, uh, you know, even when you someone comes up with something silly, uh, by prefacing it by saying, you know what, you may be right, or you know what, that's a new thought, or I'm going to think about it. I, I don't know how, but I will think about it. It might work, you know. So never put down a child. Uh, we all have selective memories. Look back at your own childhood you would remember some great times and you would also remember some stinging remarks that somebody made inadvertently because adults don't care. They say something, you know, but in the child's mind, it gets inscribed. So my first point is, you know, lead by example, be kind yourself. The second is, if you really want to build anything, a culture of kindness, of generosity, of whatever, Please remember all human beings, children included, gravitate towards their self-interest. So reward kindness. Institute a prize for kindness, if, if you may. At the end of the year in your class have top five kind children, uh, students, all right? Celebrate kindness. When somebody does something kind, make sure it is repeated. It's in fact should be repeated in the school assembly. So unless people have a stake, unless they believe that kindness is going to reward them, uh, sheer lectures will not work. The third is encourage children to volunteer for good stuff. By good stuff, I mean, uh, I understand schools are extremely busy with their curriculum and they really have no time left. But if you can build some extracurricular activities such as a visit to an old age home, regular visits to an old age home, maybe once in three months, uh, to an animal shelter, or any such place where children, by the virtue of what they're going to do, uh, have to be kind. And that, I think, will give them a very practical lesson. The fourth and the last thing I'll say about this section of the question is, 
you know, I was reminded when I went to the US for the first time, the Indian Army sent me to study in a think tank. I was struck by how civil people were. When you entered an elevator, for example, people acknowledged your presence. They wished you. As you left, they wished you again. In the morning when I went for a jog, every jogger coming from the other side said hi or good morning. As you entered a Starbucks, the person behind the counter yelled out as if you were a long lost relative. So I told one of my aunts who lives in USA, I said, it's amazing the civility in this country is so great. She said, ah, oh, don't, don't, don't put too much to, uh, you know, store on it. It's cultivated uh, civility. They've cultivated it. So don't give them too much credit. I said, I far more prefer the cultivated civility than the cultivated uncivility that I find in my part of the world. If you want to have kind students and kind children, I think there should be cast iron rules about being civil, no matter what the provocation. Businesses like, excuse me, may I pass? Good morning, good evening, thank you, I'm sorry. You know, they must be ingrained at every step. And no matter what the conflict, no matter what the fight, no matter what the confrontation, children should be, you must insist on their being civil. Uh, you can have a disagreement for sure, but civility must be, uh, must trump everything else. So this is the first part. The second part is, you know, there's so much unkindness around us. You can't insulate children from the unkindness that is happening in the world. We are particularly living in a very divisive and an unkind world. And I'm not just talking about India. So how do you, can you insulate them? The answer is no. It's like saying I'm going to sit on the seashore and I'm going to curse because I don't like the waves. Well, the waves are upon us. You're going to get wet. So there's no insulation possible. What you can do on the other hand is to consciously begin to de-edit students from social media. You can't do it forcibly. You have to point out the dangers. In fact, there are many strategies in the world today where people are consciously thinking of how to de-addict from social media, the fakeness of it, the unkindness of it, the cruelty of it. I mean, you just have to take a walk through Twitter to realize how many people there are sitting uh, who are committing virtual murders. So, and those strategies is what students, what teachers must learn. There are wonderful resources for that. There are books like Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport or Deep Work by the same author. There are podcasts on the subject. And I think let's arm ourselves and try to point out to our children, sensitize them of the dangers of social media, not to get off it, but to sensitize uh, them to the nature of social media. Uh, I would say uh, the second bit that we can do is to consciously teach the values of equality and I dare say secularism. I come from an organization, I hope you know that in the Indian Army, we no longer have separate temples and separate mosques. Everything is done in one, one room called Saradharam Sthal. We have a temple and a mosque and a church and a, you know, a Gurdwara Sahib and everything else. And people are very happy with it. Why I'm brought in secularism in this part is because much of the unkindness that is flowing out there, uh, like a wild river around us, is to do with emotive issues, religion, caste, ethnicity, me and the other. That seems to have become a perpetual theme. I am not good enough till I can tell how bad the others are. So I would say, let's be conscious about this in our own setup. When a, for example, when a schoolboy walks in, when one of the peons walk into the class, how you respond to that person is going to be a great lesson to your students on how to be kind. If the person sees the teacher wishing that person saying, hello, thank you, saying something like that, genuinely, I'm not for manipulation, I think that would be a great lesson in equality and we should, in any case, teach our children and we are equal. I mean, it's not something that I'm, that we have to really make up. The last is how do we distinguish between kindness and pity when it comes to, uh, you know, teaching our students? It's a tough one. Uh, students don't, young children don't grab every concept and assimilate it and analyze it. I'm all for a little bit of rote learning. You know, <laughs> there is an age 
where you cannot grab, you can't wrap your mind around what a tan theta is, for example, or what a cos theta is, because you've never met Mr. Tan theta on the roadside. You don't know what it looks like, right? So at that point to say, I'll first, you first, I will analyze it to death and only then you will move forward. is not always right. Sometimes you just got to give it in packages. This subject of pity versus this, I think is one of those topics. Uh, but you can teach. You can have something called, uh, some of the teachers do something called empathy charade in the, in the class, you know, where people do role play or people have to guess what the other person is feeling like, or you draw a little cartoon or a little face on the, on the board and people have to guess whether it's happy, sad, what is it? Okay. Role playing, I think is a very powerful thing that you can do, which children can do. It's a fun activity where one child is brief to be sad and talk all the sad things. And the other child is asked to think like that child and to find out what, you know, what's wrong, what should be done. Uh, that is one way you can bring uh, more empathy. Also, encourage a lot of armchair travel. Travel not just geographically, but also travel into other cultures, other ethnicities, particularly in our own country. This business of dividing ourselves based on because he doesn't look like me, he doesn't talk like me, he doesn't behave like me. It's it's a uh, it's wild, and it's the it's an antidote or it's a uh, obstacle to building kindness. When you understand the others, when you realize that they too have a viewpoint, there is an operating environment which in which everybody works, uh, the Africans or the you know tribals or us or whoever. Once you start teaching about culture. And people realize that everybody's got a magnificent culture and a background and history. I think that could encourage them to develop more kindness towards even complete strangers, which the other, you know, for example, when I was growing up, the Africans, I'm sorry to say, in my school, what I understood was that they were cruel people. We call them by a certain name. They were cruel people. They would murder, they would kill, they were like animals. I had the opportunity of serving in Lesotho, a small Southern African country, for three years as the advisor to the prime minister. And I say this without any ambiguity in my mind. They were the kindest people I've seen. It's the civilization. I don't want to compare with ours. We walk around on the roadside with murder in our eyes. We want to trample the next man. And Africans are so pleasant to each other. They're so rooted into earth into nature and being nice and being kind. Time has a different dimension altogether. So, you know, it was misunderstanding. And I was shocked that even as a grown up, I harbored a wrong notion all these years and not just a wrong notion, completely wrong notion. So teach children about all of this. I think we should also find a way to make everybody do a little bit of menial labor, what you call menial labor. I'm sorry I'm using that word. It's only to evoke an image, but no work is menial. I think we should put our children to work in all kinds of setups and environments because that gives them a far better appreciation of what the others do. You know, when you join the army as an officer, what happens for the first three months? You're put into Jawan's barracks. You made to sleep with them, same room, same barracks, go to their toilets. You're not allowed to come to the officer's mess. You dine with them. It's a sure fire way of building empathy. Right? So we can do some of it in the schools with our children. Teach them the value of all work and how glorious it is, uh, no matter what the work is. So I'm going to end with uh, a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, there is a quote by Henry uh, David Thoreau. He says, uh, could a greater miracle take place for us than to look through each other's eyes for an instance? What a miracle is it that you look through another human being's eyes and sense his joy and his pain? Uh, I'm going to wrap this up by saying, but why should we do all this? What really is the need? Aren't we good enough coming to school and teaching and going away and going to our offices and coming out and after all we are in for earning a living. 
you know, when you teach people kindness and when people do kind stuff, you're not just reaching out to one human being. That ripple goes right across and lifts the happiness quotient of many people. So management guru Simon Sinek has said, you can see this YouTube video. He said he was walking along and he saw another guy walking in front and that fellow dropped, you know, his bag opened inadvertently and he dropped some papers. So Simon Sinek rushed up, picked up those papers and said, uh, your bag opened, so here it is, you know, your papers. And that, and, and Sinek says that that act of doing something uh, selflessly for another person makes us happy, right? This act of kindness made Simon Sinek happy. You know why? Because there is a chem chemical called uh, oxytocin in our body, which is released every time you do kindness. And that oxytocin produces a warm, fuzzy feeling. By the way, it is released in large measure when women give birth to children. So Simon Sinek felt happy. And that man turned around and said, thank you. And that man felt happy because he was thanking a complete stranger. And as they walked further down the road, another guy came from behind and told Simon, he said, I saw what you did. That was nice. And that man, because he was paying compliment to Simon Sinek, he was being kind to him, also felt happy. This is the impact of being kind. Once you, make, once you convert a human being into an essentially kind human being, the day he becomes a leader, the day he becomes a boss, the day he becomes a principal, you know what? He's going to send happy human beings back home. And those happy human beings are then going to go and make everybody else happy. Isn't that obvious? You have a bad day in office, you go home, what do you do? You tell everybody, I'm not in the mood. That is the power of kindness. We can send a ripple right across the universe. Well, if not the universe, at least in your, uh, you know, uh, all around you. Thank you for listening. We've had some patience. You've been very kind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, General Dali. I think uh, we could not have asked for a better introduction to the topic. Thank you so much once again. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker on the topic is Achin Bhattacharya. Achin is the founder and CEO at Notebook, a chartered accountant by training. Achin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Achin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland, and a member of CIMA UK. He's also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Achin has keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He's a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Achin, over to you, please. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, absolutely. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. And this very interesting topic, very touching topic. We all, at different points of time, have, have been benefited, have been touched by small gestures of kindness. For instance, when a stranger asks us which floor are we headed to when you walk into your elevator, or when our friends include us in conversations when we are upset, when we are quiet, or I remember during school days, a friend of mine patiently walking while I'm trying to quickly tie my shoelaces while everyone else continues walking. And sometimes, especially during pandemic, what we have seen during the last two years, the way we all, members of civil society, strangers, we say a short prayer 
whenever we see an ambulance going past our car we have seen how as a society as a nation as a world we all come together to support and pray for each other but when we discuss about kindness and when we turn the pages of history we some see some very beautiful instances wonderful gestures of kindness for instance i was reading about this uh, christmas truce between german british and french soldiers during world war 1 1914 during december 24 to 26th this moment in the first year of world war 1 saw soldiers from different countries putting aside their differences in a no man's land it was a temporary ceasefire which allowed the homesick troops to trade prisoners collect their dead or wounded colleagues swap cigarettes and food and even sing christmas carols in the battlefield and play football together it was seen as a as a symbolic moment of peaceful how humanity can come together a moment of peace being one of the most violent events in human history the other incident that instantly comes to our mind in 1987 princess diana and it was it was a a uh, front paper uh, like headline news at that point of time shaking the hand of a man who was suffering from aids and we are discussing about 1987 the, the the entire rhetoric around aids was fear induced the public were unsure about the nature of the disease how dangerous it was and how it could be transmitted but when the princess visited a hospital in london she was photographed shaking the hands of a patient suffering from it without wearing gloves this single moment of compassion changed the dialogue globally around aids challenge the false belief that the disease could be transmitted by touch and showed her unwavering kindness for other people another incident again very touching is about japanese pensioners who volunteered to work in fukushima so there was a nuclear crisis in fukushima japan and a group of around 200 japanese pensioners volunteered to face the dangers of radiation instead of their young countrymen they themselves came forward and called themselves the skilled veterans group they were a group of retired engineers and other professionals who volunteered to take on the danger of working on that area we all know that when you are exposed to radiation especially nuclear radiation there is a huge possibility of danger from cancer but they knew and they came forward and they said that the cancer that they could develop from the radiation will take more than two decades around 20 years to fully develop meaning they may no longer be able alive to experience it and they wanted to save their younger countrymen from them from from the disease they themselves came forward you know wonderful act of kindness the other uh whenever we 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 discuss about titanic or we see the movie the actions of this gentleman harold low who manned the only lifeboat that returned to the wreck of titanic a 29 29 year old officer he was the only person and he knew he had his fears despite the fear that the boat would be swamped by desperate people the moment it goes near the ship desperate people who of course would naturally want to hold on to whatever they they get around them and eventually drown he still turned his boat around and went back and saved as many as six people from the freezing sea 
Next incident, of course, is uh, very touching, very heart touching. I was reading about uh, a charity in UK uh, who basically supply, who basically give give away gowns for stillborn babies, and these gowns are made from wedding dresses. So this particular charity, they give the families of those babies who are either miscarried, stillborn, or maybe pass away shortly after birth, handmade clothes for the baby to be dressed in their funeral. And the families are, are given a gown made of repurposed wedding dress, a small boot, a hat, a cloth, nappy, and a blanket in which to clothe their child. And this charity was created when the founder, when the founder of this charity made a gown for a local bereaved mother from her own wedding dress. And they now provide these clothes made by volunteers to hospitals all over UK, free of charge to any family who is in need of the same. The other very, uh, you know, I think uh, an incident which is inspiring for all of us is about paid forward movement. I'm sure many of us are aware about it. This movement encourages everyone to do three unprompted good deeds for three different people, such as giving someone an umbrella when it's raining or paying for a coffee anonymously and asking nothing in return except that the person paid forward. That's it. This movement has spread around the globe and has, and then, and today it even has a book and a film named after it, the Spade Forward Movement. The other uh, incident that I was reading about, I think very sweet uh, gesture of uh, a footballer named Andre Johnson, who every year, every year spends thousands of dollars for buying toys for disadvantaged children as a part of child protective service. So every year around Christmas, children and uh, members of the family, their siblings from disadvantaged communities are taken to the biggest of toy stores around the world. And they're given 80 seconds to grab whatever toy they want, anything that they lay their hands on. And that bill is entirely picked up, the tab is entirely picked up by this gentleman. He does this every Christmas. So I think so many wonderful and beautiful examples around us of human beings coming forward and indeed showing acts of empathy and kindness. So I think taking, taking this further, few ways in which I believe that uh, we can actually foster kindness and empathy in, in, in kids, in children. I think first and foremost, uh, I think Jayan Bali also mentioned this very, very appropriately, that apples actually, they don't fall far from trees. So it's, it's important to model compassion, compassion by treating friends, neighbors, colleagues with kindness. Because expending energy on, on caring reciprocal relationships will actually teach children to prioritize friendship and positivity over popularity. Because children who are hovering at the periphery of alpha groups, which often happens in, in teenage years, etc., often struggle the most. Constant maneuvering for, for, for position in the social hierarchy can actually, because if you look at things from their perspective, it can lead to insecurity, envy, anxiety, competitiveness, all of which at some point of time may promote meanness and without them understanding what it's all about. But children who have sensitive role models in parents, in, in, in teachers, educators, of course, they are much more likely to behave in a more gentle manner. It's much more likely. 
second i think very is very important to to be honest to keep it real because being inauthentic damages credibility with kids and it's a fact that kindness doesn't mean or doesn't require liking or speaking positively about everyone all the time but the moment a child comes home or expresses himself or herself about a, a, an incident which he or she didn't like a negative incident which he or she felt mean spirited i think it's important to take that opportunity and talk about it and remind the child that it's possible to make bad choices but still be a good person we don't need to pretend that they have to be friends with everyone but we can teach them to be respectful and polite and of course to avoid burning bridges friendship often often cycle in and cycle out as kids change and mature as they grow over the years priorities change preferences change so promote this social growth by by praising kids when they are considerate when they are doing something good of course that needs to be appreciated even as they as as time passes they will outgrow friendships and move on to other relationships move on to other friendships other aspect of course is 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 very important is to ensure that if 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 to to stop the bandwagon effect stop the contagion anybody who has spent time in a toxic environment knows that behaviors like gossiping or jockeying for power and negativity can spread very rapidly so being in a mean climate can alter individual behavior and why only kids even adults are vulnerable to it so this stuff matters and i think it's important it's important for for parents and educators to ensure that we establish a positive social norm which wherein there's a culture of understanding systematic problems like as we discussed be it insecurity anxiety or or struggle for power within groups but activities like for instance going for going for uh, field trips collaborative projects are opportunities wherein actually children get an opportunity to to be more receptive to the other person's perspective to be far more flexible so familiarity comfort and shared experiences are things like which which makes it much more easier for children to establish their own core values and most importantly develop a culture of respect and cooperation next of course would be to teach compassion through mindfulness because mindfulness is can actually enhance attention span and reduce stress and researchers have also found that it can actually foster empathy so there was a study in in northeastern university where in participants took an eight week meditation course and when they were faced with the option of giving up their chair to a person in visible physical discomfort they were far more likely students who actually meditated were far more likely than their peers who were not part of the program to act kindly to act beneficently and when an another incident another part of this, uh, another you know small incident which which goes on to prove this a middle school in a very poor san francisco neighborhood i was reading about this started offering twice daily meditation periods every day two periods for meditation and a lot of kids prior to that were being suspended because of unruly behavior this suspension decreased by nearly 80% by nearly 80% after they started this meditation sessions every day two periods so i think it really goes on to show that how important this is other um, aspect which i think is is equally important is giving back to community it it is actually very important jail bali talked about it beat beat volunteer engagements it actually it actually widens the children's world view and teach them gratitude it also builds their awareness and sensitivity sensitivity to other people struggle and the moment they are placed in unfamiliar settings uncomfortable situations it actually heightens their ability to empathize 
with anyone who feels like an outsider or lacks a sense of belonging. Of course, uh, talking about the importance of diversity, I think it's self-explanatory, has to be there. Because the moment children are taught that their lives are enriched when they encounter and befriend people from, from be it from different racial, ethnic, socioeconomic background, or, or, or other children who may be facing some kind of learning or physical challenges. So the moment they understand that everyone is an individual and that it's dehumanizing to label them, kids need to be self-aware and self-accepting as well. And the moment they're more self-accepting, they are less likely to be judgmental or prejudiced. Other aspect, of course, is uh, I think a very important aspect is to get moving. So researchers at the University of Michigan studied middle school children and found that those who are more physically active in terms of physical activities, exercise, et cetera, outdoor sports, involved in outdoor sports, et cetera, they had much better leadership skills and empathy skills. So I think these are some aspects which are really, really important. I remember a very beautiful quote by uh, Mother Teresa. And when we discuss about kindness, I think uh, no discussion about kindness can ever be completed without uh, discussing about her good work. She once said that kind words can be short and easy to speak. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. I think short quote, but really sums it up very well. So today, if we look at different ways of kindness, I think first and foremost, few, few very important points before I wrap it up. I think kindness always starts with being kind to yourself, which is very important, being kind with ourselves. Are we pushing ourselves beyond our tolerable limits? If we are kind with ourselves, only then we can be kind with the rest of the world. Second, of course, is Leading with compassion and following with kindness. Third, there's no doubt about it that to understand this, that whenever we are at a crossroad, we need to choose kindness. And teach our children that when they're giving us something, there's a pleasure in it. There's a happiness in helping someone without expecting anything in return. So I think these were some thoughts that I wanted to share with all of you. I thank all of you for giving me a very patient hearing. We have a wonderful panel here today, panel of senior educators. And we really look forward to hear from them, their perspective, their views, on this beautiful topic. I thank all of you again. Over to you, Pari. Thank you so much, Achin. That was so wonderfully said and summed up, I think. And uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, as Achin mentioned, we do have a wonderful panel lined up for you. But before we start with the panel discussion, a little about us here at Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech platform that creates short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. This means that every topic from every subject of the school's syllabus has been converted into a series of short videos that can be used in two different cases. One is when you as a teacher are starting out a topic in your classroom, you can play one of these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. These videos are just six to 10 minutes in duration and take up very little of your class time while offering the right kind of material to students to generate curiosity and excitement. The second is when the student is studying at home, months later, they have access to the same videos on their personal devices be it a laptop or a smartphone, they can watch the videos over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you had taught. What I'm going to do now is play you some short snippets of notebook videos so that you know what they exactly look like. Hello and welcome to Notebook. Today, we are going to discuss a socially relevant story called Children at Work. Geeta Wolf and Anushka Ravi Shankar are the co-authors of the story. The renowned artist Orijit Sen is the illustrator. As he sits on the platform and closes his eyes in exhaustion, he hears a voice calling him. Velu turns around to see a girl of his age 
carrying a sack on her back, wearing a banyan and collecting dirty plastic cups. This cooling causes the water vapors in the air to condense in the form of tiny droplets. The tiny droplets gradually collect and in excess form clouds. Thank God you're home. So tell me, in the morning you were telling me that something about pure milk not being pure. Uh, tell me, I want to know more. <laughs> you really do want to know more? So listen, the literal meaning of the term pure milk written on the packet signifies that it contains proper proportion of water, proteins, carbohydrates, fats and mineral salts that are commonly present in milk. So there is no need for you to get confused. I know it says pure but it's not pure. It's confusing. I get it. So let's do something. Let's watch a video that I came across so you will understand more about this. Parisi, hello. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those were some short snippets from notebook videos. And as you just saw, we have connected with over 2,000 schools and have had more than 26 lakh students benefit from our videos. If you head over to our website, www.notebook.school, or use our mobile apps for Android and iOS, you would find more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal. With that, it is now time to introduce the wonderful panelists that we have with us today. We have with us today, Dr. Rupali Dhamdhere, a, a dynamic and phenomenal principal who knows how to lead difficult but crit critically important situations, goes beyond the day-to-day -day demands of a position to create an exceptional educational environment. With seven years of experience in banking and 20 years in the education sector, from teacher to the principal, she has molded her leadership style for teamwork, efficiency, and the work ethic to keep getting better. Dr. Dhamdere is currently the principal at Trinity International School, Pune. Her formal experience in education dates back about 20 years, but her study preparation goes back much further. She has earned master's diploma in journalism and communications from Symbiosis, Bachelor of Education, University of Pune, Masters of Science, University of Sikkim, and PhD in Analytical Study of Teaching Pedagogy, University of Tonga. To her credit, she has been recognized and awarded with Indian Humanitarian Award 2020, 50 Most Influential Principles of India, 2019, Best Principal Award 2019 for contribution to Swachh Bharat Abhiyan and many others. She actively promotes a passion for learning by collaborating interstate and national workshops, speaking at conferences, and serving on committees to innovate strategic educational answers. She researches and publishes educational strategies and even hosts multiple collaborative pieces of training and workshops for numerous organizations, including the CBSE board. Ma'am, thank you so much for being on the panel today, and we look forward to hearing your views on this topic. We also have with us Chaya Chaturvedi. We also have with us Chaya Chaturvedi. She holds a BCom and MA in English and a BA degree. She has over 27 years of teaching experience, teaching all classes from 1 to 12 and has been department head for more than 12 years. She has received the best teaching faculty in school and the best script writer and director award in district level drama competitions and various environmental issues. She is presently working as principal of Bharti Krishna Vidya Bihar in Nagpur, an eminent CBSE affiliated school in the city. She loves cooking and listening to music in her spare time. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making time and joining us here. We also have with us Dr. Ambika Prasad Gaur, who holds a BSc, MA English, B.Ed, MBA, PhD. Dr. Gaur originally hails from Uttarakhand and has an experience of about 30 years in the field of education. 
He has worked as PGD Assistant Professor in Management Institution in Noida, Educational Consultant with Mr. Kailash Satyarthi, the Nobel Laureate in Delhi, and has worked as Principal in Schools. He is presently working as Principal at SOS Herman Minor School, Varanasi. He is also the author of more than a dozen books in Hindi as well as English. So thank you so much for being back on the panel and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you. So I shall now switch on my camera. And uh, once again, a very good evening to all the panelists. And thank you so much for being here. I would also request all the panelists to kindly unmute themselves and switch on the cameras, please. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Once again, a very good evening and thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here. So uh, I'd like to direct a few questions to you know each one of you. And um, I'd like to begin by asking this to uh, Chaya Chaturvedi. Ma'am, uh, what I want to know from you is uh, how do you educate students about the value of kindness? Thank you, ma'am. And good evening, one of uh, all of you present over here. I agree with Mr. Bali's uh, statements, what he told, that first of all, we need to be ourselves be a role model. While teaching anything, we need to be ourselves inculcating those things and uh, like imbibing all those things and in, informing the children. Being a teacher, I believe if we start with a, uh, like small things, like thank you, uh, telling thank you in front of the children to all those who are working for us, automatically the children will also learn those things. Being a teacher in the school for so many years, I have started doing many things to inculcate such kind of a habit. I have started uh, a club called CMCA club. I'm focusing on my experience. Uh, I started with the CMCA club, which means a children's movement for civic awareness, where we, I have taken a lot many activities in which one is a thank giving activity where children thank everyone. They realize that as uh, Mr. Bali told, we, to, we need to be empathetic. Empathy is a keynote to be uh, a kind person. So we have started with uh, the club where the children thanked everyone. We have we celebrate Kindness Week where they tell about the stories, what deed they have done as a kindness, and we celebrate that by giving uh, appreciating them in the assembly. Secondly, uh, we have a, a ACP um, program, Citizen Awakened Awaken Citizen program, where we pose certain kinds of situation where we involve children have a fire classes to discuss the thing and automatically we are inculcating inculcating all those things which we believe they should and teaching good things being polite tell, uh, respecting others these are all to raise a kind child i believe that and um, secondly uh, we have a cell where uh, all uh, like disabled children where they are challenged when special children are there. They are, we believe in inclusive education. So we have many children along with us in the school. Our school children actively participate by taking care of them. Caring is very important to be a kind person. So they take care of it, right? Rather they pity them, they care for them. They, they uh, try to bring them to their level. They bring them down, they take care of them. So all these things I believe are the things, how we teach the values of kindness to the children in the school. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Uh, I would like to direct the same question now um, to Dr. Ambika Prasad Gaur. Uh, doctor, what would you like to say? How do you educate students about the value of kindness? Thank you, Gagori. Am I audible? Hope I'm audible. Perfectly. Am sir. I audible? Uh, first of all, you know, uh, my namaste and good evening to everybody, all the esteemed panelists, uh, Dr. Rupali, uh, Madam Chaya, then uh, Major General Bali, Achin, uh, to you also, Gagori, and all the uh, people, those who are attending this webinar. So first of all, I'm thankful to you. That's very kind of you that you have chosen such a topic, open-ended kindness, so actually, uh, when I was told about this, so 
somewhat, you know, I felt like that these people have very cunningly uh, put this particular, chosen this particular topic, uh, quite open-ended with the kindness by the teachers, kindness by the students, kindness by the parents, kindness by the school management. Anyways, open-ended, so anybody can speak on this and, you know, at any length it can be asked. I'm thankful to uh, the uh, nature today that after, you know, that long spell of heat wave in Varanasi, uh, we have uh, got showers of rains today. So the climate has become, you know, quite uh, pleasant over here in Varanasi. We, it has been scorching heat, in, in fact. And I was caught up there in the, uh, that storm also, and then the rain storm. So <laughs> it was very kind of the nature also. Uh, very kind of you people also that you have to do such a topic. Now coming back to what I have been asked to uh, say a few words about kindness. Uh, Gagori and all other esteemed panelists, uh, our school, SOS Harman Minor School, Varnasi. Uh, uh, first of all, you know, let me just tell you something about the background of SOS. SOS Children's Villages. So this is working in 134 countries of the world and uh, 22 states in uh, India. Our concept is basically uh, is based on kindness itself. We have got the children, those you know who are studying, you know, major chunk of this is studying in our schools. That is Harman Minor Schools. Harman Minor Schools have uh, got 12 branches scattered uh, in India. So our major uh, theme is kindness only. Dr. Harman Minor is an Austrian philanthropist. Uh, he started this particular organization and uh, whereby the children, those you know, who had lost their parents in Second World War. So some of them, you know, were taken uh, care of by Dr. Herman Miner in Austria itself. And then after that, you know, when he started uh, getting larger number of students under his, uh, you know, this uh, plan. So uh, he started thinking of, you know, uh, spreading it in other countries also. And today is in 134 countries, right? So kindness basically starts in our organization from the very beginning. We have got the children who are very destitute. Some of the children, those who have been thrown by the parents on railway tracks, some of the children picked up from the garbage and uh, they are growing up here and uh, getting fully educated and they are kept with us uh, under the SOS banner uh, till they get uh, so till they get fully educated and then they get some sort of uh, employment also. So kindness is inherent in our organizations. So far as uh, kindness in a school curriculum is concerned, uh, we have been taught. And of course, you know, it's uh, running in many boards also, in many classes also, I've still seen. Uh, we are taught a story uh, about a lion and a mouse where you know a lion was uh, jumping across a lion was sleeping inside its den and a mouse started uh, disturbing the lion and when you know uh, the lion woke up so it uh, caught hold of the uh, of the mouse and it started uh, is, uh, that lion was about to punish the uh, mouse but when it said oh uh, oh king you know it was my fault and uh, please uh, uh, I apologize for the mistake committed to you. So anyway, and sometime, you know, whenever some help will be, will be there, I will be definitely helping you out. That was the wording of the mouse. So the lion laughed that what a little mouse, uh, in what way can this little mouse uh, help me? Anyway, it let it uh, out of kindness, it let it uh, go. So after some time that what happens that uh, after a few days, uh, the lion was caught in a uh, in a sort of, you know, uh, uh, in a net and it started roaring. So hearing the uh, lion's roar, the mouse came from somewhere and cut the net and freed the lion. So lion was very happy. And then the mouse told the lion that, yes, you go back three, four months back or whenever, you know, uh, you, you were about to kill me, but I at that time, I promised that uh, there will be some day when uh, uh, you will be in trouble and I'll help you out. So this is the day today that you're in trouble and I've helped you out. At that time, you mocked at me, but definitely I had helped you out today and I freed you from this net. So this kindness, you know, I, what, what was the uh, uh, main idea behind telling the story is importance of kindness. Kindness always pays back. The little words of ki kindness, the little deeds of kindness, 
the kindness in our heart always pays us back. In our, uh, you know, Indian philosophy, uh, I'm not talking the Western culture, I'm talking the Eastern culture, our culture, where, you know, uh, we have got that uh, very deep rooted that we should be kind to everybody. Mansa vacha karmana. Mansa vacha karmana means by heart, mansa, vacha, by our tongue. You know, whatever we say, we must always uh, speak the kind words. And uh, karmana means in our action also that that kindness should be in our action only, not only, you know, the lip services, not only in the words. So manasa vacha karmana, these three types of kindness are told. And then, you know, uh, Colonel, uh, sorry, uh, Lieutenant General Bali and even Achino is also telling something about the uh, sympathy and empathy. So let me just make this point clear also that about sympathy and empathy. Sympathy may be that, you know, it, it, it is the, it's, it's a sort of work of kindness, you know, when we're showing uh, some sort of uh, some so, sort of service that is lip service, you know, it can be sympathy that somebody is in trouble and we are sympathizing with that person. So that can be more of in words only. But empathy is, you know, when uh, some sort of action is also there. Empathy is that when we are putting ourselves in the shoes of that fellow who is in distress. So that is empathy. That's basic difference between sympathy and empathy. So empathy is more powerful than sympathy in that way. Anyway, they both are the uh, forms of kindness. One is the form of uh, kindness in words. The other one is the form of kindness in uh, deeds. There have been plenty of other stories uh, that are being taught uh, to these students. Uh, like, you know, one famous story is there about uh, uh, that uh, one is, you know, King Suddhodan has got the son, that famous uh, Gautam Buddha, known as Siddhartha in his childhood. And the other one was, other prince was Jadrath. Jadrath was his cousin, actually, Siddhartha's cousin. So what happened that Jadrath has shot a swan once and this swan uh, flew to uh, Siddharth. Siddharth got hold of that and, you know, just wiped the blood and, uh, you know, gave some water, some sort of other things to that sword to drink and eat. And after that, the swan got a bit, you know, relaxed. Uh, after some time, uh, Jadrath also comes and starts fighting with uh, Siddharth that this swan belongs to me. No, but Siddharth said, no, it, it belongs to me, not to you. So that fight came up between the two cousins and ultimately the matter went to the King Suddhodana. So King Suddhodana, he helped both the, both the parties. Both the parties were adamant. Siddharth was also adamant that, that this swan belongs to me and uh, Jadrat, sorry, uh, that other fellow uh, was also adamant that uh, this belongs to me. His argument was that because I have shot it, so it belongs to me. And uh, Siddharth's argument was that because I have saved the life of this one, it belongs to me. So ultimately, the uh, the verdict came in favor of Siddharth, right? Gautam Buddha. Well, कहने का मतलब है कि मारने वाले से बचाने वाला ज़्यादा important है. So in case if suppose somebody is showing some sort of kindness. So that entire things, sare ke sare law jo usi ke favor mein bolna suru kar dete hai. So that is the importance of being kind. So these are some of the stories told. Then uh, coming back again, you know, as is open ended, hum baat karte hai ki whether this kindness is you know on the part of the teachers, whether it's in the part of the on the part of the parents, whether it should be on the part of the uh, students. I was told, my previous speaker has already told about that, what she is doing in her school. She has got some sort of clubs, kindness club is there. And uh, then the children are told about to perform something and to do some, at least one act of kindness, you know, every week or every day, whatever that is. So that is about the students, right? She has already told, uh, uh, you know, in an elaborate manner. Uh, about the parents, the kindness shown by the parents, actually, whatever the child learns, uh, a child learns from his or her home. So in case if the parents are talking very nicely, very kindly to the helpers, there are so many of them, mates are there, trippers are there, drivers are there. And in case if the parents are showing some sort of kindness towards them, so of course the children will also learn the same thing. But if the parents have attitude, we are giving them money, so they are our so that sort of things, those children will also learn the same thing in case if the parents are unkind towards the 
uh, helpers, the, the, the gardeners, uh, the drivers, the maids, the sweepers, etc. So there the role of the parents comes first of all. Right, then comes the role of you know the other relatives, and then comes the role of the uh, the society around you know the the neighbors, and teachers come after that. You know, once the child start going to uh, school, and in case if the, there uh, the child sees the atmosphere that the peers and the mates and all uh, the teachers are uh, not treating them well, they are not speaking to them kindly. So same thing, the children also start learning. But in case if suppose we are calling, we as teachers, suppose we are calling the uh, helpers and mates by their names. Not by calling them, hey, either up. Like, you know, ki, whenever some sabji wala is going in a particular uh, street, and uh, unfortunately we say, hey, sabji, hey, sabji wale. So, I mean, you know, uh, somewhere, you know, we are not teaching uh, proper things to the students and to our uh, coming generations. It's better always to, uh, when, you know, once the children, they, uh, they, they are in the school, so we as teachers, we as principals, we as educators must make sure that we are calling the helpers by their names, right? Rather than calling them, ki, oh, either ao, are either ao, not like that. So these are the things, you know, which will have a positive impact on the psyche of the students and they will also learn the same thing. generation I parents to blame that the parents are not treating them अपने हेल्पर्स को तो बच्चे भी वही सीखेंगे उनको वही संस्कार सीखेंगे अब मैं टीचर्स की बात करता हूं कि टीचर्स का भी है कि भाई वंस यू नो एज आई टोल्ड यू दैट वी आर आल्सो कॉलिंग द हेल्पर्स बाय देयर नेम्स बाय द स्वीट वर्ड्स बाय काइंड वर्ड्स वी आर कॉलिंग देम इन केस इफ देयर सम मिस्टेक्स आर बीइंग कमिटेड कुछ गलतियां हो जाती कभी एंड वी आर वेरी हार्श विद देम सो आवर चिल्ड्रन आल्सो लर्न द सेम थिंग सो इट्स आवर ड्यूटी आल्सो हमारे पास भी बहुत बड़ा बर्डन है बहुत बड़ा हमारा जिम्मेदारी हम लोगों की भी कि वी हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट वी टीच द student something and finally when the question of the students come bachon ka jahan tak aata hai matter so children you know they are they, they they learn whatever the parents say and what they learn whatever their teachers say wo to bahut baad mein aate hain but as ma'am has told the previous speaker she has already said that some sort of days are dedicated some days are dedicated uh, for a, say a particular day is fixed say like saturday that everybody has to present a case study uh, what that child has done uh, as, as, as an act of kindness, right? So uh, let there be a session by the students and the students must uh, come and they must volunteer by telling that, well, ma'am or sir, I have done this particular act of kindness in this particular week. So of course, you know, this is also a very, a very welcome, welcome note, very positive development. It will definitely have a positive impact uh, uh, in the minds of these students and definitely we'll also learn many things in case if suppose children if they show certain acts of kindness and then they present themselves so obviously we as teachers will also learn many things from them right so uh, with these words why i once again uh, thank you all for your kindness thank you very much for being kind uh, to me uh, for patiently listening to my views thank you so much to you Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ambika Pisagar. Um, I would now like to direct the next question to Dr. Rupali Dham Dere. Um, hello, Dr. Rupali, and welcome. So, uh, Doctor, my question to you is, students witness unkind behavior in media and outside school. How do you counteract? Uh, unkind media and, uh, uh, you know, things outside school. Uh, Media has become quite powerful, uh, you know, uh, in these past two years. And uh, yes, let's understand that our social media and, uh, you know, uh, our presence online and technology, though it has been with us for quite some time now, it has uh, become a little more aggressive and the use also has become a little more aggressive uh, in these past two years because uh, of the situation and the, we facing the pandemic. So we all were looking at, at, you know, connecting and we all were looking at other solutions as to how we can uh, connect to people and the basic nature of a human being, uh, you know, being a social uh, person and a social animal. So, you know, we were looking at basically connecting, but it is very, very important on our part also that uh, today, when everything is available to the child at the fingertips, uh, it is very, very important to be very, uh, uh, you know, vigilant when it comes to what your child is watching. Now, it is 
uh, not possible that 24 7 you can keep a watch on the child and what is happening but yes uh, definitely there can be a uh, you know a locking system there can be a vigilance in uh, the sites that will be uh, popping up there are various ways and means in which you can educate the child so being cyber uh, you know the cyber safety uh, norms and the tips that we are saying should be a regular part of teaching and conversations within the family outside so that we can make our children stronger and uh, to let them know that the things that are happening or negativity if it is coming on the on the groups because children take it really too hard so there is it is it is important for us to explain that there is more uh, coming over so we can we can be a little uh, vigilant and uh, basically being open to them talking to them and making them understand is what we can do and of course follow the rules ourselves if we follow the rules ourselves and they uh, watch us doing that then definitely uh, they would uh, you know have a better safer uh, interaction and social life online as well Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I you. would now like to uh, take this same question to uh, Chaya ma'am as well. Uh, ma'am, would you like to add something to this? What are your views on this on how yes. students witness unkind behavior in media and outside school and then how do you counter that? Yeah, we have come across just like I agree with Dr. Rupali ma'am that uh, since last past two years, the things which we, are, which we were keeping away, uh, uh, children away from those mobiles and all those things, we were forced to that they they use they are using it and they are more uh, like smarter than the teachers and the parents are because they know and on the click of finger they are accessing what they should or they shouldn't not also and many a time while during the classes also I have seen the unkind uh, behavior done by the children also i believe uh, that it, this is going to happen. We need to uh, like make children stronger uh, by telling them what are the like drawbacks of such certain things, making them aware of those things and being with them, monitoring them. And moreover, I believe spending quality time with them. Parents should spend time, discuss. If they are very closer to them, they can openly discuss the things with the parents. They can tell the children what is right and what is wrong. Once the child is trained properly, uh, automatically he or she understand what is right and what is wrong and he won't indulge in wrongdoing things, unkind things. Secondly, uh, I believe if we encourage our children for the uh, towards productive work, engaging in some other works, automatically they will be disconnected for this kind of things and moreover, uh, counseling them, taking care of them, monitoring, main thing is monitoring. I agree with Dr. Rupali, ma'am, today all the parents are working. We do not know what the children are accessing, but that depends upon your uh, upbringing, how you are upbringing them, making them stronger, and the, uh, the, the company they are having, you need to keep a check because you cannot avoid your children by saying not using those social media because now they are used to it and uh, many things which we are also asking them to search and surf and get the work done. And we ourselves at last two years, we were already uh, like depending upon all those things, but we know very well that using those uh, facilities, misuse was also being done. I believe that parenting, teaching, counseling, monitoring, and turning the child to the productive world will automatically will uh, keep the children away from this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, because uh, you know you answered this question right now, I would like to direct the third question to you, self, and then of course would like to know what uh, you know, Dr. Rupali, Ma'am, and Dr. God think about this. Uh, how do you teach students to distinguish between kindness and pity? Pardon, you're asking me. Yes, Ma'am. Okay. Uh, frankly speaking, pity means taras khana hota hai. When we hmm. pity somebody. And when we, kindness is totally different from that, we take care, we want to improve the situation. Such like when we see something like uh, some accident have taken place or something has happened, we pity, but rather we don't care for helping them out. When there, there's a difference between kindness and uh, pity, like pity without kindness is very, it's useless. We pity the things, we uh, sometimes what happened, 
when we pity somebody he or she the recipient might not like those things he might be feeling ridiculed he might be feeling humiliated because we are pitting moreover more, nobody likes i have seen one uh, student in our school uh, we i told we believe in inclusive education we have variety of students in our school it's very popular school in nagpur for where uh, disabled where uh, autistic all are being taken into the classroom with a normal child and we are treating them one of the child in my school he is having one normal foot and one uh, foot is uh, is i'm suffering from some kind of a disease which is increasing uh, like uh, we can call it like an elephant foot and he is unable to walk so uh, people try to help him out but he did not want that he wanted to be equal so he did, did not uh, want that the children should come and pity him he is taking care of himself he is not taking help of anybody and he is like take uh, uh, climbing the stairs with his own effort so what i mean is kindness is where when we are doing something to improve the situation giving comfort and improve the situation pity is something just we are showing which, which is without any help we pity the things hum tarah se khate but we are not helping them out but kindness is where we the person who is empathetic is kind and he is going to help the out to improve and make the situation comfortable improve for the other one right thank you thank you so much hana uh, dr rupali ma'am would you like to add something to this please ma'am you're on mute can you please unmute yourself so sorry uh i would like to uh, just put it in a very simple way uh, pity is being selfish and kindness is being selfless whenever there is pity there is some form of uh, you know superiority that comes on to you that is why you kind of look down upon someone and then you are uh, uh, you know knowing unknowingly you are having that uh, sorry feeling for the uh, for the other person whereas kindness is just coming out very naturally and it's a it's a gesture uh, that comes out without judging or uh, you know having judgmental feelings for the opposite person so i would say kindness is selfless and pity is being selfish thank you thank you thank you ma'am uh, dr gaur sir would you like to add something what are your views on this how do you teach students to distinguish between kindness and pity gagori pitying somebody is you know i generally say that it's a sort of negative emotion but kindness is always positive again you know coming back pitying may or may not be uh, negative always but definitely kindness is always positive i repeat my statement pitying may be uh, positive as well as negative but kindness is always positive emotion right pitying somebody may be uh, that you know when uh, ma'am has already made it clear that when you know a sort of superiority complex we are showing if we pity somebody so at times you know we uh, just even if showing that well we are forgiving we are forgiving the fellow and we are pitying just we pity on him and we are forgiving him it can be also used in that particular sense also that somebody is saying nonsense and somebody is saying you know all nonsense uh, uh, things and doing all nonsense deed but we are pitying that 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 person does not know that you know uh, what 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 is the right thing so in that way pitying can be in that uh, other sense also but kindness is always definitely positive and more of the actions involved in kindness in pitying you know uh, generally you know this sort of uh, words only right i hope uh, a sort of definition from my side also thank you thank you so much sir uh firstly let me quickly thank you uh, you know all of you for your time firstly the 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 amazing panelists dr amrita prasad gaur thank you so much sir for sparing time and being here with us today dr rupali dham dere thank you so much ma'am uh, for your valuable insights and for joining us in this session today and uh, ma'am shaya chaturvedi thank you so much ma'am once again for your time uh i think this has been an absolutely fantastic session and um, Achil, if I may please invite you now to do the vote of thanks. Sure, sure. I think a uh, really wonderful session, no doubt about it. Very seamless, uh, very free flowing, and some wonderful thoughts that uh, that we all got to hear.
I think, of course, uh, General Bali gave us a wonderful start, starting from beat uh, his uh, uh, experience in a small African town or his wonderful experience with uh, one of the most respected institutions in the world, Indian Army, be it in terms of Sardham Sthal or be it in terms of how officers was joining initially spending a few months in John's barracks to build empathy, to understand actually what they go through. I think wonderful thoughts from JL Bali. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Also, uh, our esteemed panelists, you know, some, I, I, must, I must say that uh, when, while going to today's session, I felt that you know, each and every thought that came to the surface, be it in terms of, uh, I'll start with, uh, of course, uh, Chai Chaturvedi, ma'am. I think I really like the fact that uh, how, ma'am, the way you, 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 you shared with us thoughts about the fact that you have started a club when you're celebrating kindness. And the, and, and the best part of, of it was that also at school, in inclusive education, how children, they're caring for their peers, for, for their friends. I think, I think our last question that we discussed, the difference between pity and kindness, I think that's a live example. So really caring for them, really ensuring that making their lives and experience better. And also, I think another fact that you mentioned, ma'am, I couldn't agree more. The importance of spending quality time with children. Pete, and especially in today's age when we have working parents, nuclear families, you know, grandparents not being there. So I think it's really important that whatever time we get to spend with our children, it's quality time to ensure that those footprints are indelible. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Uh, Dr. Gore, I think, sir, uh, some, some great thoughts from your side, especially the kind of wonderful work that you're doing for destitute children. So as you shared with us, so inspiring for, for all of us. And I think this particular line and mouse story, it's self explanatory It really sums up the entire thing. It's about sharing kindness. It's about you know, kindness coming back to us in circles and how we can indeed make our own lives in this world a better place to live in. Now, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your time and for your wonderful thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rupali Dhamdere, ma'am, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, some great thoughts from you, especially the bit, I think, a very practical thought and very relevant thought. Importance of being vigilant, especially in times of cybersecurity, etc. So this, I guess, is one of the one of the you know biggest problems or biggest threats that today, as as parents, as educators, you know, as, as that that we face to ensure that our children are, are not are, are kept safe. So I think this is a challenge, this is a day to day challenge. And I think thank you so much, ma'am, for, for highlighting this. So I think we had a, we overall we had a great session, uh, some seamless uh, flow of thoughts, some wonderful uh, things coming to us. I'm sure members of our esteemed audience who are here with us today benefited from this. I thank all of you again, and I really look forward to your continued support in the sessions to come. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajay. Thank you, Gaguri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, sir.